Fighting out of Sacramento, California. Woo! What you gonna do? Better. Stronger. Son of a bitch. Faster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And that's why I was even saying to you um, a couple days ago, if you remember, I was like, accountability groups can be a thing. I did one when I was in, when I used to, when I was in my early twenties and really big into going to church and, you know, help, you know, but it was also impactful in my life. You, the other people of similar interest in, in places in life, trying to help you, uh, trying to help each other achieve a common goal. I mean, I think that's kind of what an accountability group is. Yeah, we have like um, a group here of like four people. It'll probably be six by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, they're all trying to lose a lot of weight. And I think that that's important to um, my, my goal with it really isn't about holding anybody accountable. Like it's not about me holding you accountable. Like I'm not going to do that. I never do that. It's not, not the way I operate. Um, but it's for you, it's for everybody to hold each other accountable. Like the bigger idea, I guess what I was trying to explain to you earlier is that nobody can hold, nobody can hold your feet to the fire. Of course. They, you have to do the work, like right. no matter what, right? right? Like you have to do it. So whether you do it and I know about it or you do it and I don't know about it, um, it just depends on your personality, right? Some people like to, like I said, like I get pictures every day. <laughs> and well, I, you're in a unique position. Yeah, and most people don't have a hundred thousand followers. On and Instagram. it's interesting because I'll get, I mean, I'll get, you know, ten pictures a day of yeah. like what people eat. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, thank you for sending me a picture of the only day you ate good the entire year. So you're like literally oversaturated with these human interactions. I am probably. Yeah, like done with it. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. like I'm like, you dude, I don't care about your truffles. Like, mine look way better. I don't, care. you know, it's like that's how I get. I get started, be like, I don't care about yeah, the, yeah. you know. Um, but it's not that I don't care. I care about the people. Mm -hmm. But all I'm gonna do is give you like, all you're gonna get out of me is like, right on, good job. You know, like that's that's all you can get. And, and if that's all you need, and that's why you're sending it to me, then that's that's great and it's fine. Um, like I said, like it doesn't um doesn't hurt to send to send me something like it doesn't it doesn't bother me necessarily but i just think it's ironic and funny because i'm like oh now you're gonna send pictures like what i was saying is that you never get the pictures of the guy on vacation you know when he's out at dinner with his family like splurging on his desserts and you know like you never get those pictures mm -hmm. it's always like the pictures where like so i think okay so they're curating your experience i, I really okay so my my whole question to that is I agree with that analysis, but or I agree with that observation, but I'm curious what your analysis is of that observation. Because that observation in and of itself is almost meaningless. Well without 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 the some sort of analysis put with it. The analysis is that if you want to send me pictures of your food, send me all of it. Just don't send me when you decide to eat. Send and, me all of it. Send send it to me for like an entire week every single meal that you ate, right? And then I can see, oh, there's not one bad meal in here. And that's exactly my point with an accountability group. That would be good. The accountability group is, hey, I send you a weigh-in on the first of the month, every month, whether I went up or down. That's a different level than just buddies being buddies with each other. That's a different level than just, hey, you're kind of my mentor. I'm checking in with you regularly, but I'm not really, this isn't like a, a, a it's almost like peer coaching. It's almost like peer coaching. Accountability groups kind of like peer-to-peer -peer coaching. And that means it requires an effort beyond doing more than just casual feel-good acts. You have to really show the whole thing. And then that's why, and, and that's why when you said, hey, I'm starting this accountability group, the Carb Warriors, uh, at, first I, at first I was a little like, oh, my, okay, okay. But then I was like, okay, well, if we're going to do that, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, it's the first of the month. I'm going to put in, I'm going to send in a weight. Not only did I send in my weight, I sent in the whole tracker, the ups and the downs of the last 10 months of my life, right? And then I sent out yesterday. Now, that little thing I did with the Fitbit with you guys, no, man, sure. That was just me me exclaiming joy with a friend. I, was, I wasn't trying to necessarily, maybe there's an attaboy or maybe there's, I don't think it's bragging. I was happy I had a good day yesterday. 
you're a friend, you're someone I look up to in this area of my life. I shared it with you and I shared it with Mark. Yeah, the thing is, I, I never know what it means, just so you're aware. Like you sent me a chart with like ups and downs. I said, uh, and I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so uh, people send me that all the time well, too. They the, send me it, like it, their Fitbit information. I'm like, I, I can't read that. I don't know. It, I mean, is that, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping that it's good because he sent it to me. Well, I mean, if you read what I said underneath it, I said, uh, I said, I killed it yesterday. That's what it means. Yeah. I killed. But here's the thing. You're so busy with digital interactions. It's really hard for you to actually, you're like, you're like on life support with digital interactions. So you don't really give digital interactions a lot of time because if you did, you get so many of them in a single day, your entire day would be yeah, just you, responding I, to everybody. I used to, and now I just like, in order to stay away from that, I just, I put out really simple information. It's really easy. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing easier. You know, people try to explain nutrition for days on end. They have all these uh, different posts and different memes. And I can get in an elevator and tell you, don't eat any carbs and walk out of the elevator before it hits the bottom floor. And you have your diet. And that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Like, in my opinion, like, that's all you need to follow. Like, Lane Norton put up a whole post about how carbs don't make you fat, how carbs won't kill you. And my uh, rebuttal to the whole thing is like, yeah, but if you were to pull carbohydrates out of every single person's diet we wouldn't have obesity. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I totally get it. But in my, my point in, uh, on the first of the month, I put out a, a, a weigh in and, 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 and yesterday putting out a, hey, this is, you know, or this morning I asked a question, what's your meal plan? Because maybe these, anything like I had stated in the text message, but I'm not sure if you had the bandwidth or time to read this morning. I said, any, for this to mean anything, I have to use it like any program. It only works if you work it right. Yeah. And, and I've had a, a, an epiphany of sorts lately that most of my weight gain is a direct result of distraction, not focusing on the diet, not focusing on the action, not focusing on the preparation. So I am efforting to stay focused. You know, I remember Gourmet goes keto me once upon a time he had a daily like a daily meditational you know devotion that was a tool that he used uh i don't even know exactly what the book was but he had something he started his day with that just helped him get in the mindset of what he was going to do and part of what he was going to do was lose all that weight he lost in a couple of years so uh that's been a big a big revelation for me personally and i would imagine for other people in my situation you know this this propensity to overeat this propensity to binge is is um it's not something that we want for ourselves, but it's almost like a default behavior and we have to focus on not defaulting to that behavior yeah and the opposite of focus is distraction and when my life gets unmanageable when i'm not taking the time to plan what i'm going to eat for the next couple of days i get distracted and then i i fall back on bad behavior it's really crazy but we have we have mental health issues when it comes to eating like, that's the bottom line. It's a mental health issue. It's, it's really silly to think that, like, um, like Mark says, like, if you eat bad when you're sitting on your couch, maybe you need to get rid of your couch. <laughs> right. And that's how sick we are. Like, right. you might have to throw your couch in a dumpster and light it on fire because that's where you eat bad. Mm -hmm. But if, if you think about it and you did get rid of your couch, where would you eat bad? Would, would you, like, go and sit in a hard chair in the corner and eat bad? Probably not. You'd probably like go out for a walk. Like I don't have a couch and I don't have a TV. So, you know, like my, I had a, my TV blew up on me and it, you know, blew up for like four months. And then my dad felt bad and like went out and bought me a TV and I, I didn't even really want it. I was like uh -huh. trying to not get it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I kind of like having no TV. My dad's mm -hmm. like, you can't have no TV. Mm -hmm. you can't not have no. And I'm like, nah, I kind of, you know. And um, now that I have a TV again, I find myself sitting in front of it doing the thing that got me fat in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, maybe I should, you know, not throw out the TV, but maybe I should turn it off more often. You know, maybe it should, shouldn't be there. And maybe I should throw out my couch if that's the problem, mm -hmm. you know? And, but that's like, that's mentally insane. Man. When you, you know, when you think about it, we have these really, um, we have this Labrador brain that we always, we always go back to, 
the simple, like, oh, I'm just going to eat it. You know, and if you think about it, we're grown men. Like, a grown man can't control his appetite for a cookie. Like, for a cookie, for a, a chip, it's ridiculous when I, you think about it. I, it. It is ridiculous. And I've had to come to the terms that I'm ridiculous. Yeah. And I have to just accept I'm a flawed human, hope that I can eventually fix that flaw, but in the meantime, like, wage war against that flaw. Is it a flaw or is it just human nature that we want to be happy, have dopamine? You know, like, what's really crazy is that um, there's certain foods that they, they hit those receptors and you can tell also the same feeling of having like ice cream when you have something that tastes really good that's really nutrient. So like in my opinion, when I, I know some of the really high quality like Piedmontese steak that I eat, when I eat like a filet mignon and it's cooked perfect and it's super tender and, and super juicy, like when I eat that, I get like this, like a high, like, oh my God, like, you know, you feel... When you eat something amazing, you feel like amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I can feel that eating a steak and I can also feel that eating a cake, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what is the, um, why not do it with the steak? You know, like why not get there with, like the, there are foods that you can eat that are really highly satiating, steak and eggs and things like that. When I make chaffles, chaffles are just, you know, pastured eggs and cheese, but they're really nutrient dense and butter. So cheese, butter, and eggs all together on your fork gives you this like high in your brain, the same kind of high you feel when you eat ice cream. Yeah, I, and, and to whatever, whatever malfunction I have in my thinking, I need to intentionally work against it. It just is, I'm not, I'm not proud of it. I'm certainly, I am, okay. I am certainly already ashamed of it. That's why I advocate the unnecessariness, is that a word? Yeah. Of that shaming. I'm already ashamed of it. You know, I, I don't I don't need extra piled on. I, I doubt I uh you know that same one percent that you said can just you know it's interesting. You said you're not, I, you're not like standing online at the store. And being like, I hope somebody comes up and tells me I'm overweight because I really need yeah. to get like, you, you don't you don't need you. What you're saying is like you know, and hearing it is just worse, right? Like it's piling on. May, may, so maybe maybe um, just like you even said, one percent can just go out and stop, and for and the rest usually don't. Maybe that's the same one percent that doesn't understand. Maybe that really was the same one percent that just needed an epiphany. Oh, I'm fat. I need to do something about it. Maybe, and then for them, like I had an epiphany in my early 20s. Uh, you know what? I'm drinking a little bit too much. I need to do something about it. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a lifelong battle for me. So when I feel, when I see people go, hey, it, when people go, hey, I, I was fat shamed. It woke me up and I did something about it. Maybe those people just needed a little bit of an epiphany and it worked. I, I think for most people, they already know. And in spite not and in spite of knowing, they are helpless to do something about it. not because they are unable to do it, but because they're not they're not practicing the behaviors needed to to fix the problem. I wanted to ask you because um I think like we we were talking a little before. I think we had a little bit of a misunderstanding on where we were at. I was like trying to say stuff without um like I never want to come off mean or like I don't care. But what I'm saying is when I say like um I made an accountability group and I'm, it's kind of like for me to just be like, Hey, all you guys, I want all you guys to stick together. I want you guys to work together. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm like in it, but I'm not going to like, I'm not going to like make people do things. I'm, I just don't operate that way. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think the best thing I could do? What is the best thing? Okay. Forget anything that I think or, or think about it. What's the best way I can help you guys? Well, I mean, I think you're doing it. And, and let me back up to one thing you said. You said I made an accountability group for you guys to work it. And I guess the question is then, what is the parameters of working it together? I think you said work it together. So what does work it together mean to you, to them, to us, to, to most people? Like there was three of you guys in here the other day 
all together at the same time. Mm-hmm. The day before, there was another three. You mm-hmm. weren't here, but the, the other three guys mm-hmm. were here, right? And so hopefully we can work it in to get all four of you guys here on the same day and then get, you know, there's another two guys that want to join. Hopefully, like, we can have some days where all of you guys are here together mm-hmm. and you're just maybe, like, all pushing the sled together, all doing, mm-hmm. like, whatever together. Like, and, and it breeds this... um camaraderie and maybe you guys hang out like my goal my intention is not necessarily not necessarily for me to be like oh let me go hang out with fernando today right but my goal is like maybe russell and fernando get together and go on a bike ride Mm -hmm. maybe um russell and jerome get together and they lift weights together Mm -hmm. i I don't know i don't know where it leads So that leads me to think like so what's the so that is like a great example of like a possible minimum level of of uh interaction right meet up once every couple weeks give each other a high five give each other well wishes be there to give each other uh, a a spot move the sled have a moment i I feel the text group is good by the way i don't feel like it's too much right now i feel it's like at a good pace i I feel like everybody has accountability along with enough like i'm a grown-up i don't need to be babied like Mm -hmm. nobody's asking baby questions people are really just writing like nice positive things like hey man mm-hmm. i crushed it i ate chaffles today and i had i did this and i did that mm-hmm. and um and i think just that's great yeah um, i don't i don't think there needs to be some i and i i'm not suggesting any significant rework of anything i yeah. think it's in a very it's all in a very good spot i would just say the occasional the occasional uh i think a, a once a month a once a week or a once a month weight check in could be a part of it that's yeah. that's my opinion, and I and uh, every now and then I don't think anyone needs to be nominated to be the leader, and I don't think anyone needs to be uh, needs to be uh, itemized on how much they're choosing to or not to participate. But you know, hey, this is what I'm working on. What are you guys are you know? How are you we're, guys? We're about this? to get um, it's about to warm up out outside, and what I'd like, what I'd really love to do, is um, get everybody outside on a weekend for like a half an hour, 40 minutes, just like pushing the sled back and forth. And I don't want anybody to die or get heat exhaustion or anything like mm-hmm. that. I want it to be like at our own pace, but like I want us to be out there in the sun. I want us like, um, say I, I tell like, um, okay, Russell, you and Fernando, I want you to push the sled between the two of you, like all the way down there. So like one guy starts, one guy walks, another guy pushes the sled, right? And then we come back, right, with, with other guys. Things like that outside. So I you're think, like trying to say like team building exercises? A little bit of uh, no, yeah, it's kind of like a little bit of like boot campish stuff outside, but like nothing, nothing too hard. But yeah. I feel like doing it all together is like fun. Yeah, like I personally have almost zero interest in doing. It. I mean, I would most likely do it to just participate and and be a uh, a um try to be you know a team player, but. Like I, I I don't I don't want to I don't want to have the fat boy group sweat session. I don't no. not interested in that at all. No. I, I, I it just makes me more you know. Uh, I mean I, I'm not. It just makes me feel more in a way singled out for my fatness. You know, <laughs> it yeah. really does. Yeah. You know, it's and that maybe that's just well, my own my... brokenness. Like I was really loving the fact that I saw that panda guy uh, doing leg presses with Andre and with one of the other men on the power team and i was like oh yeah. he's he's whooping ass like, and I, I was i would say trying to learn the english letter english language better as you can tell i'm trying to i need to figure out the difference between jealousy and envy i wasn't like i wasn't mad at him but i wished i was more flexible a little bit healthier that i could get in there with him i've always wished i could work out with justin but justin's a big it, justin's yeah, it's a just big that, strong kid it's funny he that you say that because boys. You know, Mark and I took the girls outside. This is what I was talking about. We took girls outside the other day, asked them to push the sled back and forth, up and down the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And the girls just like went out and went along and did it. They didn't feel like they were singled out because they were girls. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to me, it's not about that. To me, it's about like, we want to get some exercise in together. I think that's a great way to do it. But, Mm -hmm. you know. If you don't want to do it, I'll just leave you out of it. That's all. No, I'm not saying I don't want to do anything. It's I've already been through like real boot camp, so I don't have like I don't have like fancy full boot camp sucked. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it's not it's not to like it's not to single anybody out to get people to work out together. Yeah. And you have to group people. I mean, just realistically, 
you're like, yeah, I like seeing Andre do that with Panda, but like Andre is a world champion power lifter and the other guy, like, so you have to take off all the weights, right? Well, Andre was coaching. He wasn't actually working out with him. He was, they were, they were doing it with that other man on the team. I don't, I, I can't, I don't know people's names well enough to, oh, yeah. to, to say who it was. But well, well, that's what I'm saying. The, the idea is to get people working together that can work together. Mm -hmm. Not that mm -hmm. can't work together. Mm -hmm. Like if you're big guys, you're going to have to set up the racks a certain way. You're going to have to set up equipment and, a certain way. So it's like, to me, that's like, oh, okay, get these guys together and get them doing and, it. And, and I'm speaking somewhat selfishly, not out of maliciousness, but out of self-protection. I've already said, I, I can't, I can't even hang with those guys. Those guys haven't broke their ankles and knees yet. They're yeah. still in their thirties and twenties. I am brittle. I hurt myself so easily. Never had to be like so concerned about low impact. So I, I don't want to be out there having like this as the word, you know, and I, I'm not. I say this all the time though. Most of this is diet. Of course. Most of this is diet. Of course. Right. So, so that's why I put focus on diet when I sent that text message. So this you, is why I'm eating today. So you don't have to train that hard. So all, and like, like I said, all the stuff I'm asking to do, I would never ask anybody to do something that's too hard for them. Mm -hmm. You know, cause I'm the last person that's going to do that. I'm, I always have pain issues. So I'm mm -hmm. never going to ask somebody to do something mm -hmm. they physically can't do or mm -hmm. physically is going to. I watch, them. I, so I watch Gourmet Goes Keto put his food and his exercise up on Instagram almost every single day. So the whole idea, someone is sharing with you that they're winning and then what happens? They almost always fall off. I mean, you're right, but then what's the choice then to not share because you know the odds are you will eventually fall off again? Or do you share again? You know, every single, every single motivational speech is about it's what counts is to get back up. Yeah. If that's to get back up, you know, I, I think there's a getting back up every single day, though, that doesn't that doesn't <laughs> that is failing. You know, like you, yeah. you, you have to string some days together there's a, for sure. But there's a difference between failing and failed. Yeah. Failed. Failing is falling down and getting back up. Failed is falling down and staying down. So say I say, um, hey, you know what? Um, your your specific diet is don't eat carbs. And every day you get to like 5, 5 p.m. And you're like, I made it all day. And then boom, you have carbs. And you do it every single day. A hundred percent, you're right. Then you're, you're failing. You're not doing, you're right. not, you're like, failing. Well, you almost made it every day, but you didn't really quite make it every day. So uh -huh. it doesn't really count. And I, so I think until you can string some days together where you're like, oh, hey, today I won. Well, good, post that. Today I won, post that. And again, the, and again, to the point of, bringing this back that for some people, this overeating is more of an addiction than a disorder, right? What do you, what did we learn in therapy groups? What, you know, one day at a time, one hour at a time, one moment at a time. And for some people, you have to take that perspective to it. You know, you have to win the moment. Now, winning the moment and bragging about it like you're winning the year is disingenuous and unproductive is, is I think what you're saying. You actually have to string some time together, right? Yeah, you have to have a couple of days going where you done the diet, done. The, you know, like when I look at when I look at it and go like, "What did I do differently that got me to where I'm at right now?" I'm like, I went at least six months without eating a carbohydrate. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's like that. That's mentally. Mentally insane, you know what I mean? Like I just went, you know what? This is the way I'm gonna do it. And I went strict for a really long time. Mm -hmm. But that got me really, really good momentum. Mm -hmm. It got me so far out ahead that it keeps you out ahead for like a couple of years mm -hmm. to where you, you, know, you can maintain that right. without doing that every day. Like now, right. now if I have carbs three times a week, I wouldn't, wouldn't gain a pound. Right. But- um, I really believe, and maybe I'm wrong, I believe that you're, your hormonal system's probably healed. You're probably more hormonally balanced. I, I'm a believer in how that, I, I, maybe I'm just faith in what I want to see in the world, but that metabolic syndrome X, that insulin resistance <clears throat> versus sensitive, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's bro science. I really don't. And you probably have healed your system a little bit to some degree. Um, insulin resistance is a little bro science. It's a little bit... Um... It's very like it's very like misunderstood 
So like insulin resistance, like you should have already reversed that on a keto diet. Like if you're on a keto or carnivore diet, you're not really insulin resistant anymore. As long as you keep that up for a while, you keep that up for a couple of weeks, then you basically re reverse a lot of that. So you literally, without either knowingly or unknowingly, just put a stamp on exactly what I was just trying to make a point of. You just probably articulated it way better than I did. But I tried saying exactly what you did. So I completely, that's what I think. I don't think it's, I don't think it's unhealable. I think it's just a condition from, you know, chronic bad dieting behavior, yeah, right? But the problem is, I think, I don't know. I don't know this for a fact, but here's what I'm thinking. They say that, like, if you're not insulin sensitive, you're insulin resistant, you don't use insulin well, that when you take calories in, you're storing everything as fat. However, when you go, go on a low carb or keto diet, or you do some of these things like Dr. Ken Berry, like reverse type 2 diabetes. Well, if you can reverse type 2 diabetes in two weeks on a carnivore diet, why wouldn't you reverse insulin resistance in two weeks on a carnivore diet? Why would you not be fixed and healed when that's, my only when that's the problem? My only understanding against that is because a lot of what I've, what I've heard on the internet, what I watched on YouTube, is a lot of your body dump of insulin is directly related to the body fat level you have. So there's, it's kind of two stage. You got to get rid of that initial part, but then also you have to reduce your body fat so you're not just constantly dumping insulin based on the body fat level. Is that not true? I think what you have to do is get your insulin down and then keep your calories down for a long extended right. period of time. And that's what gets rid of the insulin resistance. Your insulin levels, if your insulin resistance are insulin resistant, are chronically high. And if they're chronically high, it's never getting a chance to like recover, right? And so chronically high is bad. It causes inflammation. It causes all these other problems. So if you did two weeks of dieting and it went down and then you were in a calorie deficit, it should stay down. But however, if you do, here's what I don't know. Your insulin resistance, you go two weeks of dieting, you can mess up your insulin resistance like with fat. So you might be eating too much fat mm -hmm. and then becoming insulin resistant again even though you're not eating carbs. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So I don't, I'm on to something. I just need Lane Norton's help. Right. Where are you, Lane? Now, so, I need, like, honestly, I need somebody smarter than me to, like, help me with the idea of it. But, like, the idea of it is, like, you should be able to lose weight, get rid of insulin resistance. But then I'm imagining you have to stay in a deficit in order to continue that streak. Otherwise, you may become insulin resistant again, just mm -hmm. basically due to eating too many. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Right. Or I might be crazy. No, I, I mean, if type 2 diabetes is brought on by bad dieting, then if you, what you're basically, if I am understanding you correctly, you're saying you can, you can reduce it or eliminate it with proper dieting, but then you can obviously just put it back on with bad dieting after the fact again, right? Yeah. I mean, One thing I wanted to say is that, um, like, I, I started a couple of things here at Super Training Gym, and I just, I didn't know, the, like, the power that we have. We started this little accountability group. I also got some girls training here. I have B and Jessica, and then they brought their other friend, Garmin. Garmin? Yes, I think and so. And she was really strong, too. And then they have two more friends that they're going to bring. This is like, I remember, like, when I was in church when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. It's like, you used to go to the church, and then, like, we had this lady come. Her name was Aunt Marge, and she'd give out candy. And then you'd bring friends, and then you'd, they'd bring more friends. Like, it was a big thing at, at our church, like, mm -hmm. we, Kids would get all excited. I feel like we're building something cool like that. Like, so we have the the group of our um, carb warriors over here losing weight. We have this group of girls that are like super savagely strong, which is really really cool to see. Um, and then we have a good amount of people just coming in, like everyday people. But we also have a good amount of kids, and so we're gonna have sort of a kids group, a women's group, and a big guy group, right? Like. Kind of great to have these, um, these this growth. Well, isn't that what Mark and Andy talked about? They don't want the gym just to be recognized and known solely for powerlifting. Yeah, they don't they want, want it. Yeah, want, want it to be everything. Yeah, yeah. I, Their heart know, is for our, all groups of people to get healthier and stronger and fitter, right? Yeah, That's it's interesting vision. too. Like when you see Mark in here in the gym, who is he talking to? He's never talking to the most jacked guy in here. Right. That guy doesn't need Mark Bell. Right. You know, like. You uh, and Seamus' friend came in the other day, 
super jacked, good-looking guy. Beautiful man. <laughs> I'm like, you don't, yeah. I, I basically just said, all right, you don't need any of my help. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. out of here, right? Yeah. Like, he yeah. just started laughing. He's like, no, no, man, I'm, I'm pretty new to all this. I'm like, you don't look like it, and just like shook my head and walked away. Yeah. <laughs> and guy's like complete genetic freak, right? Yeah, yeah. But we, we get some really cool people in here, and what I like seeing is that how everything's kind of coming together, and it's, um, I don't know, we just had an environment here where we had a very small group of dedicated power lifters like Matt and his group, and they're all still here, and they're great. Um, but we, you know, we wanted to expand it out to more people, and now just seeing different walks of life you know, walk through the door is great. I mean, we have a couple people here that have um, mental health conditions, and, you know, we just surround them with love. You know, I think, like, that's the key is, like, there's a couple people here um, that don't necessarily do the greatest out there in real life, but they come in here, and it gives them, like, a purpose and a meaning, and it gives them uh, something to believe in. And I think that that's, like, <clears throat> you know, what we offer here, to me, it's just so cool that anybody can walk in off the street and just, you know, come in and train and it's free. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost you anything. And by just even walking in the door, you might learn something like a carnivore diet, a war on carbs diet, a vertical diet, something that you've never heard before once you walk in here. You know? mm -hmm. Something way healthier than the standard American fad diet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Did you watch um, WrestleMania? I only saw, I saw Vince McMahon out there looking like a champ a little bit. And I saw a couple of pretty gnarly big hits on the concrete, but I didn't like really pull watch up, it. Can you pull up on um, the internet what the, the actual card was? And I can, I can go down and give a, um, a review. So first of all, what I want to say, WrestleMania 38 was this weekend. And it featured uh, in the main event, it was Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar. But the main event wasn't even close to how exciting and entertaining this whole event was. Uh, I think I tweeted yesterday that I think it might have been the best WrestleMania in history. You know, I know we had uh, WrestleMania 3, where Hulk Hogan wrestled Andre the Giant, and that was an epic match. And in that same uh, WrestleMania was Ricky Steamboat versus Randy Savage. That was pretty epic. We had WrestleMania 6, where the Hulkster... Faced the Ultimate Warrior. It was a uh, champion versus champion. Time was an Intercontinental Champion um, versus the uh, Heavyweight Champion, which was uh, which was the Hulkster. And the Ultimate Warrior won that, and that was amazing. And there's been some great WrestleManias throughout the years. Stone Cold and The Rock uh, had some really great, you know, things at WrestleMania. All right, here we go. So. Um, all right, Back this team championship, the Usos versus Nukuso and Rick. Yeah, yeah. so that, that, let's not, okay. Nobody knows who these guys are. The Usos are basically like the Rock's uh, nephews, I believe. They're, they're okay. some sort, sort of relation. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, that was whatever regular match. Go down here. We have uh, Drew McIntyre versus Happy Corbin. This guy, Drew McIntyre, is absolutely gigantic. Came out with a giant sword. And he ended up um, going after the guy with the sword. If you click that link right there, he chops the ropes in half That's with right that here. sword. Go yeah. The... He goes after this guy. Oh, nice. And it chops the ropes in half. That was kind of cool. So that was, this is actually when I first started watching it. That first tag team match, I didn't really see much of. But then The Miz and Logan Paul wrestled uh, the Mysterios. So Rey Mysterio Jr. and his son. And Logan Paul might be the best pro wrestler I've ever seen in a debut. Like, in his first match, never have done it before. He went out there and he destroyed it. He was all over the place. He was up on the top rope. He looked like he'd been in there forever. He not only knew how to time the moves right and get the moves right, but he also had down the uh, selling of the moves. Like, a lot of people don't sell. They get hit and they don't, you know... They don't sell it good. He was selling good. And also what Logan Paul did that was phenomenal was that not only did he, um, did he like sell all the moves and, and do, you know, what he was supposed to do, he actually, um, you know, in wrestling, it's, it, it looks phony a lot. 
it's it's real easy for it to like look fake um but the timing with the audience with the crowd the way that you get the crowd into the match the way that you get the crowd to like cheer you or boo you what? it's like yeah logan paul he had he had like mastered that just probably because of what he does every day with social media uh, yeah everything has to hit at a certain time everything's got to be the right line the right thing and so he just i don't know man he just nailed it i think he did great i was texting mark afterwards and i just said you know logan paul could take this whole thing over like if, if logan paul wanted to be the rock and say like you know what i'm gonna go wwe for a couple of years i'm gonna go win the wwe heavyweight championship and then i'm gonna retire he could easily go do that he's good enough to get in the ring and be able to go do that and be able to like actually earn that and actually deserve that which i think is really cool i don't know if he's gonna want to do that um but there's all sorts of setups in here with the way that they set it up because the miz was logan paul's tag team partner but then the miz turned on him so i thought i thought jake paul was going to come out of the crowd and knock out the miz mm -hmm. but there was no such thing there yet mm -hmm. but i feel like that's i feel like they're going to start going towards either logan paul ends up boxing the miz and knocking him out probably on wwe is a joke though more than anything or you know something's going to happen there's going to be more that's a great logan that's paul a great storyline they left it open they did know? good yeah, and then if you go down um, to uh, after Rey Mysterio, there was a women's match, Becky Lynch versus Bianca Belair. Bianca Belair was at the main event of WrestleMania last year. It was the first time that women ever main evented WrestleMania. The and um, the moves that these girls do are just crazy. I think she did, does like a double flip or like a flip and a half off the top rope into like a splash. And so that's how she won the match and she won the belt from Becky Lynch and it was a big deal. And I don't know, I don't really follow the women's wrestling that much, but sort of just like um, as MMA got a lot better, women's wrestling used to be horrible. I mean, it was, it was abysmal to watch. I mean, when I was growing up, there was one girl, her name was Wendy Richter and she was with Cindy Lauper and you just couldn't wait for them to like get out of the, out of, she was at WrestleMania one. You couldn't wait for them to get out of the ring uh, the women are usually the bathroom break for mm -hmm. most things. Mm -hmm. But on this card, they had this match, which is really good. And then they also had Ronda Rousey versus uh, Charlotte Flair, which was like a really good, interesting match. A lot of like submissions and things like that. Now, if you go down right here. Here we go. Ronda there we Rousey. go. That's yep. Yeah, Ronda and Charlotte Flair. And that was a pretty good match of, uh, you know, in my opinion, I wish they were hotter. But <laughs> but that's about it. I, I don't really care that much for, I mean, I was a fan of Ronda Rousey when she was uh, fighting in, um, in pro wrestling. She does a pretty good job, but for whatever reason, it's just like, just, it just doesn't do it for me when somebody used to fight and now they're in WWE. For whatever reason, it's like, it doesn't work, you know? Did you, did you catch the uh, current 135 champ in the UFC? Uh, the Venezuelan vixen. I, I'm sorry, her her first name, her her government name is lost on me at the moment. But no. she she talked a little bit of smack about Ronda Rousey, uh, uh, saying, "Hey, you know, you left out, you know, kind of kind of what you're saying, and saying if you ever want to come back in and oh, yeah. try to you know re up your credentials as actually being a legend in the mixed martial arts world, come up and get these hands." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she did. And I, the, these girls got it, you know, all sorts of. Uh weird leg locks figure eight leg locks oh, and all sorts some, of stuff yeah, like doing that some uh doing some uh little low-key scissoring insinuation is that what you're saying yeah. yeah 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 awesome it was a little bit weird for the crowd um okay so go back up go up though my bad so then um the other match go up this one right here yeah this is uh cody Rhodes. so um in this match was really interesting seth rollins was trying to get in to wwe wrestlemania he had been in all the WrestleManias in the past, like, 10 years. He's one of the biggest superstars in WWE. And he didn't have a match for WrestleMania, so he was all bummed out. So finally, Vince McMahon calls him to his office and says, hey, if you wanted a match on WrestleMania, why don't you just ask me? You've been here forever. You know, you can have a match on WrestleMania, but it's going to be of a opponent of my choosing. Seth Rollins is like, yeah, man, whatever you want, like, I'll do it. And so Cody Rhodes, who they call the American Nightmare, uh, came out, and Cody Rhodes was use, was just in a league called AEW, and AEW was getting really, really popular. 
Cody Rhodes was like the main draw over there in uh, AEW. He's the son of the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Therefore, he's the American Nightmare. And uh, Cody Rhodes was over in this other league, uh, just really cleaning up and and almost like taking it. Like there's a point where they almost surpassed WWE and like ticket sales and, you know, TV and all this stuff like that. But WWE always ends up winning because WWE ended up making more revenue just because they were even around, you know, more, more wrestling, more people watching wrestling, more people end up going to the WWE product eventually. So Cody Rhodes came back to WrestleMania, which was like a huge deal. And he came back and he beat up Seth Rollins. Well, they had a really good match back and forth. It was really entertaining. It was kind of cool. And then Cody Rhodes came out last night on Monday Night Raw and he did a whole thing about, you know, his dad and like how his dad was a legend, but his dad never won the championship belt. And now that that's what he's going for in mm. WWE is going for the championship. Now, if you go down, this was the most amazing thing of the entire WrestleMania. If you see right here, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he comes out and this guy, Kevin Owens, that's in the ring with him. He's going to he's going to interview Stone Cold. And in the weeks leading up to it, this guy's been talking trash about Texas. This whole thing takes place at Dallas Stadium in front of 77,000 live fans, you know, fired up. People haven't been in a group that big, you know, since this pandemic started. There's 77,000 people. They're pumped. Uh, Kevin Owens is out there, got it set up for like a little interview thing. And Stone Cold just comes out and he starts trashing the set, you know, starts kicking things over and throwing things down. And Kevin Owens gets him like sit down and finally they, they're talking it out. Kevin Owens, like, I actually didn't, you know, I tricked you. I didn't get you to come here for an interview. I, I, came, I came here for a fight. And he was thinking, like, Stone Cold was going to, like, back down. Because Stone Cold's in his 50s and he's old and he's not going to fight him. And, of course, Stone Cold was just like, all right. Stone Cold just, like, gets ready to rock. Just calls down a referee. <laughs> a referee gets in the ring and they, and they go at it. Now they go at it in a no-holds-barred match. And Kevin Owens takes Stone Cold out to the end the, they start going into the crowd and Kev, uh, the stone cold goes a suplex kevin owens but kevin owens reverses it and suplex is stone cold at like 53 54 years old mm -hmm. right on the concrete wow. like brutal brutal wow. like wow. there's no it'd be like if i just picked you up and suplex you right on this you know carpet right here that just has concrete under there's no give it would kill yeah it would hurt no matter what so yeah. No matter what, Stone Cold took that. So big props to him for doing that. I don't know why he would even choose to do that at his age. Do you think that was his walkout? Is that his walkout? I think so. I think this is like the end. Because what happened is he came out, he beat up Kevin Owens, gave him the stunner, pinned him in the ring, did the whole thing like that, right? The next night, um, there was another match. So if you go to the second night of matches, I think that was the end of the first night. It's a stunner. And then at the, um, the, yeah, that one, that top one, that ESPN one. Yeah. Okay, so if you go down here, the first, um, so. Does that look right to you or go up a little? Yeah, you know, that, that's good. That's it. So go down a little bit. So, oh, Bobby Lai, okay, I don't know. That's uh, Gable Stevenson. He's actually been here to the gym. Super training. Um, if you look, Bobby Lashley wrestled this. Ooh. So this guy is seven foot three. This guy almost play that for a minute. I see. See how big this guy is? He's seven foot three. Wow. Can't really tell from that. No, but, he, he looked huge. Yeah, the guy's seven foot three, and we saw him in the airport. Really? And I was like, that guy's huge. I'm, we, we were in Atlanta, and I told Mark, like, go track him down. Like, we got to go see who he is. And we were following him, and we had no idea who he was. We haven't watched wrestling in a while. So we tracked him down, and Mark took a picture with him. It's on Instagram. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I saw and that. then we were like, are you, like, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a wrestler. And so then we had to go look him up, and we looked him up. And then what's ironic is that Mark is really good friends with Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley is uh, a guy that Mark came up with in, you know, OVW when they were, like, wrestling together and stuff like that. But, yeah, so... Um, can we go back to the, uh, WWE here? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So this match, this was amazing. This is, don't play this yet, but this was Johnny Knoxville 
versus this guy, Sami Zayn, right? And the whole thing was like a cartoon. It was like watching um, Tom and Jerry, you know? Like the whole thing was like animated. Like they had all these crazy weapons, like a big giant sledgehammer, you know, like weird. He's hitting them with a stop sign. But then if you play this, this was a surprise hiding under the ring. And this was absolutely amazing. So, you know, there was there was all these little things going on the whole time, like where it's just getting more and more ridiculous. You're like how more they, they gave you everything you wanted. You're like you're watching Johnny Knoxville wrestle and it's OK. And then like Wee Man comes out and you're like, come on, man, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, and then like some of the other guys, Party Boy, he came out. He was in like a thong. OK. You know, yeah. and um, he got his ass kicked while he was in a thong, which is funny. You know, they get completely beat up and he's just like laid out outside the ring wearing like this denim looking thong that was like disgusting uh yeah other matches aj style versus edge that's a real wrestle wrestler wrestling match you know like a real um if you really like are into wrestling you're gonna dig that i love wrestling but not that much i'm not into these kind of high flying guys it's not my thing i just never was um never was a big fan of that but this was a pretty cool match if you're into like actually people wrestling, I just like one big guy going in, you know, like to me, it was always like the Hulkster, the ultimate warrior, the undertaker guys would go in and throw three or four punches and the heavyweight division. Yeah. yeah. I was never into the, um, the little the, high flyers. The middleweights. No, yeah, I would no. pick those guys up and, and body slam those guys. Now go down a little bit here. I think, um, Oh, this was like Seamus and whatever. Yeah. We don't care about that. Oh, this Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee thing was amazing. So Pat McAfee, he wrestled, and who did he re- play this real quick? He wrestled uh, Austin the Theory. Austin Theory. Austin Theory. Okay, yeah. so he wrestled Austin Theory, but like he was re- Austin Theory was wrestling. I remember what it was. He was wrestling for Vince McMahon. So like this Vince McMahon got to pick a guy, and he picked this guy Austin Theory. And he had to wrestle against Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee's had beef with Vince, I guess. So Vince picked the guy because Vince is too old. At the end of the match, the, Pat McAfee beats the guy, right? So at the end of the match, Vince is like, well, now you got to fight me, basically. Vince takes off his shirt, gets in the ring. Given he's like almost 80 years old, he gets in the ring. He's still kind of jacked, but you can tell that this is his last dance. You know what I mean? Like he's. He's Jack, but he's he's hanging on to it. Did you see the clip of him on the Pat McAfee show where he bought machine like a thousand pounds? Vince McMahon did once. Vince McMahon is the worst cheater in the history of lifting, first of all. <laughs> so I would love to see it. Can you pull it up? I, I'll try. Yeah. Because I doubt. I, first of all, he probably had knee wraps on. I'm certain he. And it was probably like a half rep. It'll take me just a minute to find it, but I'll get it up here for you because I, I I remember seeing. It. Didn't get in it. Congratulations! It was recent. Yeah, right here, right here. On, you know, because like, nah, not impressed. He said, "I'm going to take one of these." A.M. via text message. Go ahead and run this thing, Fox. So, Pat Austin Theory, your opponent is up Just so this is that. This is actually out of the what he um, WWE headquarters. I used to train in this pounds. gym. Are you in the pit shark? Oh, this is a pit shark. Knocked out ten. Look, look at it. He's got his knees wrapped. I told you. He's always got his knees wrapped. And his knees are wrapped terribly, by the you way. You do. You do. Why did I know that he had his knees wrapped? Because you know this life, Okay, man. so look. This is, a, this is a pit shark. And look, that's not a real, like... 74, Chris. That was... <laughs> 74, Chris. That was terrible. Go back and do it again. Okay. We have standards in the lifting world, don't we? <laughs> well, let me see. Hold on. Play it again. Look at all those kids. 
Well, he, he bounced it right off the bottom, too. One more time. He knocked out 10 reps. No, he's saying Austin Theory knocked out 10 reps. Thousand pounds. You know, come on, Vince. Vince used to claim to me that he squatted 700 pounds when I worked there, when I worked at, you know, WWE. And I'm like, not on your back, though. Like, his um, daughter kept going like this. Don't, don't egg him on. Like, I don't know if she's like, don't egg him on or don't challenge him on it. I'm like, you didn't put, like, 700 on your back and go all the way down, though. He's like, yeah, I squatted 700. I'm like, you mean your leg pressed 700? He goes, yeah, well, it was on a machine. I'm like, then what did you do? He didn't even, he didn't, he didn't know what the difference was. Like, he didn't really know, like, what he, you know, I think he thought a squat and a leg press. People think everything's the same. That's what happens when you surround yourself with people that only say yes to you. Yeah. That don't challenge any of your thoughts. Yeah, you or saw ideas. me. I did a thousand. I did seven hundred. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm like, I don't. Not, not like the, not what a squat that, not how it means to me. You know. Not how it means to lifters. Yeah. Yeah. Not, but but, but guys Vince jacked. Oh no, Vince is a savage. Can you look up Vince McMahon WrestleMania 38? Sure. Because I want to. I I'm trying to get an assessment on his build. Like a couple times, I'm like, this is amazing. He's out there with his shirt off and he's 70. And then other times, I'm like, is he just hanging on? He's like, I think he looks he he looks lean, but he doesn't look nearly as muscular. And I can't you can't really fault him for not being muscular. Right. Like okay, so click on click on where he's standing against Austin. I guess he looks pretty good there, right? He looks he, he's pretty got, good, man. He's got a weird physique. Like, he's always had a weird physique. Like, look at his elbow. How his elbow. I think that's growth hormone and stuff. See that? See the elbow? See how weird the tricep goes in and the elbow comes out? and the... It's an interesting physique. 74, though. No, he looks great. He does look great. It, you know, it looked weird when he was on. Okay. When he was, like, running around the ring, it looked kind of looked kind of weird. Go down. Like, the, go up, right? Click that. See how you can see the muscle belly on his bicep? And you could tell, like, that used to be a lot bigger. So it, there's no shame in that. He looks great. He's in amazing shape for his age, for sure. But he just used to be, you could tell, he just was more filled out version of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Stone Cold looks really good. Yeah. He's in his 50s. He still looks badass. You know, overall, I honestly, I think it was one of the most entertaining events I've ever seen. Like, as far as, like, an, a live event goes, it was it was crazy. So Stone Cold comes out the next day, and um, he gets he comes out because Vince McMahon gets involved with Pat McAfee. So Stone Cold comes out to take care of Vince, and everybody goes crazy because they've had a feud going on, you know, forever. So Stone Cold's like looking in the ring at Vince. He gets in the ring. He had, decides, well, I'll just share a beer with Vince. Vince, and they're like, "Oh, is it, are they going to bury the hatches? It's going to, you know, you know, it's coming, right?" So they drink the beer together, and he gives him a stunner. So then he gets more beers. He calls McAfee into the ring. He has a couple beers with McAfee. They go up on all the corners. They do the whole salute. McAfee thinks he's in the clear. Yeah, gives Stone Cold like the big, you know, uh -huh. big high five. Uh -huh. Boom, kicked in the stomach, <laughs> fucking stunner. stunner. Yeah. Stone Cold walks off. But you have to see McAfee's stunner. I think it's right here. He sells it so well, he spits the beer in the air. Watch. This is amazing. Watch. See? He, he did it. Per McAfee did it perfect. He did it. Like, look as he's going down right there. He's horizontal, spitting in the air still. But if you play that again, let me see one more time. This is a perfect... Perfect execution of a stunner. And I I would love to bring up Vince's stunner because Vince's stunner was was pathetic. I'll tell you where you can find Vince's stunner too. Play that. Okay, watch this. Spit. Okay. Let's see Vince's stunner. Go up. 
Uh, right here might be Vince's stunner. Go down. Is that Vince's stunner? No, that's Mr. McMahon beating him up. Okay, so go to um, Instagram and go to Bo Hightower. There we go. Wait, he fell down. He, like, forgot what he was doing. Stone Cold's like, get over here. Fucking stunner. And then Vince, like, dies. Oh, is, is there, are his what did Hightower like write? What in the... What in the... No. What in the member, member berries was that? I don't even know what that means, but it's funny. Look at Watch <laughs> it's stone cold like fucking guy i fucking couldn't even couldn't even stun you right here you go again boom <laughs> it but like the way that vince sells it he all he like literally dies like he's he's like out and then i i thought when um when he did the stunner vince sold it so well that I was actually looking to see if he was moving because I'm like, he might have killed him. Mm -hmm. Like, he might have broke, like, because it was a weird stunner. It was like a weird, I'm like, he might have broke his neck. Holy shit. Because, yeah. like, the way Vince went down, he just collapsed. The way he went down on, right on his knees and ass. Yeah. And like, he, fall backwards. He, kinda, he like, collapsed. Collapsed. It looked yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I got really nervous. Like, I hope he didn't kill him. That would be the, not a young man. That'd be the weirdest thing. It'd be sad. That'd be tragic. It would be really, really tragic. But honestly, Amazing for the brand. <laughs> the, like, okay. Sorry. You couldn't find a better way for Vince McMahon to die mm -hmm. than he got fucking stunned by Stone Cold and he died. And it Sorry. killed him. The legend. The legend of It Vince would McMahon. be. Look, I don't want anything. That... I love Vince. Not wishing any harm on anybody. I love Vince. But if he's going to go out, maybe we, maybe we need to get um, The Undertaker involved in this. The Undertaker was great, too. So The Undertaker came out a couple of times. But The Undertaker said something. This is great. He seems like never retire. I used to work at WWE. When I worked at WWE, it was 2004. And they kept saying, well, this is The Undertaker's swan song. He's going to go out. Like he didn't, he didn't go out until, like, last year, right? Which is fucking amazing. He's mm -hmm. been around forever, right? Since I was a kid. Yeah. and so they, But they kept talking about his swan song being... When I worked there, 2004. So The Undertaker retires. And what's the very last thing he says? Well, first he says, like, now that I've been immortalized by the WWE, I can now rest in peace. And then he's like, but never say never. And so you know he's going to fucking come back, like, next year. You know what I mean? Like, there's, they're setting it up. Yeah. They're setting it up for... He said never say never because he's going to come back again, mm -hmm. but they're going to wait. They're going to do something big. Like they're either going to wait all the way till next WrestleMania. They're going to ride this momentum. The WWE is smart. Mm -hmm. They know that they did a great show. They have to know that they put on probably the best live. This was better than in honesty. I would never, I would never even think of comparing modern day professional wrestling to like anything I've watched in the UFC, I was way more entertained watching this, just entertainment wise. Mm -hmm. I was way more entertained watching this than watching most UFC cards. Mm -hmm. However, we have some barn burners every once in a while. There's a couple cards recently where like every fight was good, but I felt like, I felt like you never get that out of wrestling. Like I don't like modern wrestling. I haven't liked wrestling in 10 years. So for me to even give it credit, for me to say it's great, is a huge step because I didn't even think it was good. It was unwatchable. The past five years, WrestleManias were literally unwatchable. I don't know if I'm older. I don't know if it's because I've done psychedelics. I don't know what it is, but I really, really just enjoyed being a fan of it again. And maybe that's another thing. Like maybe it's come back to like, oh, you're like, I, I was involved in it. You know, like I helped John Cena get into the business. I was helping my brothers get into the business. I was, I was like, so in it and i was always so critical of it i'm thinking like am i watching it now as a fan because i still can't watch movies really as a fan you know you i'm watching a movie i'm like ah i should have done this or they should have done that or you know i didn't you know it's it's hard for me to just sit back and enjoy a movie and so i don't know but whatever it was uh this wrestlemania was the most fun and hopefully they just ride that wave and they realize what made this wrestlemania great is that it was fun 
And what they lost in all the other WrestleManias was the fun. They didn't have fun. They forgot to have fun. They just, they basically like, it got too dark. It got too sexy. It got too scandalous. Like, have John, like, okay, when I worked at WWE in 2004, if we were going to put Johnny Knoxville on a show, and they they were kind of going stuff like that back then, but like, people would be like, he's not a wrestler. He can't wrestle. You know, like, we'll just teach him. Right? Like, it used to be so... They call it kayfabe. You'll hear um, the Weinsteins talking about this. Um, kayfabe is when, like, it's a business secret and you don't tell, like, you know, like the Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were caught, like, they broke kayfabe. They were driving down the street together, smoking pot and doing and doing coke, and that's breaking kayfabe because kayfabe would say that, like, you always stay in character. You always, um, if you're if you're a bad guy wrestler, you don't travel with the good guy. Like every like you kayfabe means you treat everything like it's real. The gimmick is the gimmick is real. And um you gotta get out of that old school thinking. We're not in that old school thinking. The fact that they let Logan Paul wrestle in a match, but see what they did was very smart. They protected Logan Paul. They put him with the Miz, who's a great wrestler. And so even if something really went haywire, the Miz could cover for it, right? Mm -hmm. So they they protected him. But they let them shine also. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, that's the importance of, like, if wrestling's ever... Because I kept thinking, how is wrestling... Wrestling's the Disney version of, like, of, like, the UFC. It's like the UFC for... It used to be a male soap opera, but now, really, it's, like, a soap opera for kids. And they've really, like... They've really pushed the kid element in it. And they've taken a lot of the grime out of it you know like wrestling for a while during the 90s was all like sex mm -hmm. and they've taken a lot of that out of it and they've, they're kind of like disnifying it now and making it like more for like that kind of like audience of kids again and if they want it to be popular among the kids they just have to keep it entertaining they just have to give people what they want and like to, for me at every corner when you know like i when when vince mcmahon came out I, want, I, I so bad in my wrestling writer's heart was thinking this would be so great if the glass broke and Stone Cold came out. This would be so great. And then it happened. And you're like, whoever's writing this is great. Because like, you know what I mean? Like it never happens the way you want. As a video game player, like the video game endings never usually like as satisfactory as you want it. Mm -hmm. You never like win the game and go, oh, this is so satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's always a big bomb out. And wrestling, I feel like, is always the same way. It's like the, the payoff was never good. But for whatever reason, uh, this was great. I actually think the main event with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, that was too serious. And, like, that wasn't that entertaining. I didn't care about it. I didn't care about it that much. Because it was like, oh, they built this up too serious. You know? If that match was more fun, and I don't know how you make that match fun. I just don't, I don't think it is. I... It, I, I keep thinking this is really interesting is like they really keep pushing for this guy Roman Reigns to be at the top but I feel like nobody wants him there and I feel like um, even like he's turned like he's like a heel now I guess um, it seems like he still can't grab that ring he still can't be the John Cena or the Rock that he needs to be and I don't know why you know yeah, I don't watch it really. I don't know. I've I've seen him off and on, just sort of culture the last few years. But he doesn't. He just doesn't come across like he's got a electrifying charisma. He doesn't. Which me. is weird because he's like related to the Rock. He's a good looking dude, handsome guy, probably the nicest guy in the world. Yeah, yeah. He just he hasn't connected with the audience yet for whatever reason. And like, there's there's just something about that. There's some people that don't connect with the audience. Like you ever notice um. John Jones, it's like one of the greatest fighters of all time. For whatever reason, he just doesn't connect as being like a real guy. Like he doesn't connect as like a human being, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I don't know. It's like some people just don't have that. Like whereas The Rock is a larger than life character, but for some reason you connect. Like you want to be cool like The Rock, right? Like everybody wants to be cool like The Rock. Everybody wants to be a badass like Stone Cold. Um, you connect with that feeling and it makes you want to be that. And so for whatever reason, and I, I don't know why Roman Reigns just, um, I, I like him, but again, like he doesn't say anything cool enough for me to really be down with him. Like certain people like CM Punk, who's not a very big guy, not jacked. 
could get on a microphone and just talk his way into anything. And I loved him, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it's the, it's the personality on the mic. I mean, that, I think that that's what makes or breaks any really good pro wrestlers, like how good you are actually talking. How old was uh, Steve Austin when he kind of left the stunning Steve and became Steve 316? How old was he when he made that transition? He was probably 30. 30? Yeah. Still pretty young. He was doing that stunning Steve thing, and then yeah. it just wasn't working. Yeah. So uh, I remember, um, you know, it's crazy. It's like he was, he was Steve Austin. He was in WWE, and he was, he was called uh, the Ringmaster. And he was in WWE, and he wrestled Jake the Snake Roberts. And, he, and Jake the Snake Roberts, it was in a weird uh, religious phase where he'd come out and he'd talk about John 3.16 and talk about the Bible, and he'd be reading Bible verses. And so um, Austin beat Jake the Snake at King of the Ring. And he says, let this serve notice to everyone out there. You know, Jake the Snake comes down here, thumping his Bible, quoting his John 3.16. Well, Austin 3.16 says, I just whooped your ass. And then um, Michael Hayes was the announcer. <clears throat> and he said, oh, that, that, that wasn't necessary. And Stone Cold goes, yes, it was. <laughs> and then he keeps talking, right? And the next day on wrestling... There was signs all over the entire arena that just said Austin 316. The very next week after that, Vince said that they put out shirts. <clears throat> they just put out simple shirts that said Austin 316 on them with a skull on the back. They sold every single one of them. They sold that shirt, went on to sell more shirts than any Hulk Hogan, Hulkamania shirt ever sold. It said Austin 316. That's badass. That's badass. And it, and it came out of a. Um, impromptu line you know you walk around quoting your john 316 well austin 316 said i just whooped your ass mm -hmm. and that's the bottom line because stone cold said so all right hope you guys enjoyed that wrestlemania recap um we're just here shooting the shit talking about losing weight talking about wrestling talking about all of it uh thank you guys for following along if you made it this far and we are out of here.